I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Brother David. Well, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Brother Thomas, for that song. And Brother Sloan is on vacation this week. I hope him and Miss Peggy have a good couple of days of relaxation. Turn to uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 22. As you turn there, we'll take some quick prayer requests. 1 Samuel chapter 22. We do want to remember the Pate family and uh, remember them these days. And uh, what a, a great man. Brother Junior was just what a humble man, just a sweet man, and a kind man, and we need more of that. Amen. Amen. We need more of that. And uh, pray for Miss Mary and uh, those children and grandchildren, and uh, as they navigate through this time. But you love on them when you get a chance, and we miss them today. And uh, I'm sure they'll be in the service some. And but uh, let's continue to lift up the Pate family. Continue to pray for Walter and Peggy. I pray they have a a sweet, refreshing time. They're probably listening, so hey, Walter, I'm going to let them out early. You can do it too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, how about over here? Any, any special prayer requests on this side? Then we'll share them. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yes. Well, that was Miss Arlene, and she prayed for her sister last week who had back surgery, and they didn't know if she would be able to walk, and she's already up walking. So we thank the Lord for that. So those that you could not hear her. Anyone else in this section? How about here? Yes, sir. Yes, Bill. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's got to be tested for oh, sure. And, uh, it's okay. All right. That was Brother Bill Conlon. He asked us to pray for John and Tabitha as they begin their testing and flying and connecting flights. And they should be back here in the States midweek. So pray for John and Tabitha and those, and those children. Anyone else in this section? How about over here? Okay. Anybody over here on this? No. Okay, no one upstairs. All right, then let's do pray. Father, we want to praise you and thank you for the blessings and for the provision that you've given us. Thank you for hearing the request of uh, Arlene's family, praying for her sister. Thank you for that successful surgery. We just pray you continue to minister to her heart and her body and touch her. And Lord, we do want to just pause and say thank you for the life of Brother Junior Pate. And we pray you would minister to Mary today and those kids and the next few days as, as they walk through this period of grief. They know where he's at. He's with you. He's in your presence. He's rejoicing and, and living the life. Uh, we can't wait to get there. Heaven is surely sweeter because of men like him and our family that's already there. We know heaven is real. It, it, it's more real than 27530. We know that. We understand that. So we know where he's at. But we thank you for his life. We pray you would be with the Pate family today. Remember John and Tab as they travel back, connecting flights and testing and all those things to walk through. We thank you for their lives and their service to you on the medical mission field. We pray you give them a, a, a good, restful, profitable and productive furlough. I know they'll be here resting, but they'll be here working, raising funds, and, and just moving forward in their ministry. So thankful for them and their lives and uh, those that have supported them on the mission field. Make every connection, make every test <clears throat> positive and, and so that they'll be able to get back and come on back and be with us. And just take care of them. So we love you today. We thank you for Walter and Peggy. We pray you bless them, help them as they... 
have a little rest. And pray you bless our lesson today. We, we need to hear from you. We go through seasons of life that we don't quite understand, that we don't... If, if we laid out a blueprint of our lives, sometimes we wouldn't be where we're at. And we don't understand. But we're asking you today for direction. And as we go through these seasons and caves of life, may you help us understand that everything's a part of your will. We just have to hang on and see it from your perspective and hang on to your hand and get through it. We love you and thank you. Be with Pastor today. Bless him as he preaches to us in just a few moments. Be with Kevin and the music today. May you be honored and glorified. May we leave this place today knowing that it's, it's been good to be here and your presence is real and we felt you today. We want to worship you today, so we do that today, right now, through our Sunday school time. In Jesus' name, we pray. <clears throat> Thank you so much for coming and, and uh, being with us today. 1 Samuel chapter 22. You know, my uh, kind of creature habit I'm a contractor. I travel a lot. I'll be going to Florida again this afternoon for a week. and I'm in my truck a lot. And uh, my truck's in the shop, so I've got a rental. I've got a Dodge. I'm a Ford man, but hey, I'll drive them all. But anyway, I've got a Dodge right now. And the GPS is so different to what my Ford was. You know, the way it just does things or whatever. And, and I've heard this term over the last 10 days or so, rerouting, rerouting. She's trying to be sweet, but it's still rerouting, you know, rerouting, you know. I remember one time I, I, I built a number of Highway 55 restaurants for, for a gentleman. He, he was a franchisee. And years ago when GPS first came out, he said, David, I bought one and put it in my, my, my you know, vehicle. He said, I got so tired of hearing that lady, I took it out and threw it in the trunk. And so I thought about that this week when he told me that story. He said, I got so mad at it, I just threw it in the trunk. That's why I want to do this. But anyway, that's what our lesson's about today. It's called rerouting your life when God reroutes your life. Now, I know sometimes your GPS tells you that you're rerouting because you took a wrong turn or you're somewhere where you shouldn't be or, you know, whatever, but rerouting, rerouting. That's what this lesson is entitled today, reroute your life. And sometimes God puts us in places to where He reroutes us. And you're thinking, man, I didn't think I'd be here. I, I didn't think I'd be going through this valley right now. This is not what I had planned. In fact, is I don't see it in God's plan. I, I, don't, I don't see how this is beneficial. I wasn't planning on being here. How long am I going to be here? What's the next step? I don't see the sunshine. And that's kind of where David's at. David's in the cave in this passage of Scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2 is the passage we're going to read. But let me read it to you. Read with me. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt... Everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. And there was with him about 400 men. Do you live in a cave? Now, not literally, but emotionally. You know, sometimes you can't tell when somebody's in a cave. They might be on a pew next to you. They may be in your house living with you. Maybe a coworker, a child, a grandchild. People don't talk about it when they're going through difficulty. You know, we're really good at on Facebook and Instagram telling you all the good things that happen, but we never post the bad stuff. If you look at social media, everybody's healthy, happy, and wise. Everybody has a good day. No one has a day. No one's in the cave. But you can't tell who's in the cave. But they are. Cave's dark, it's dismal, it's damp, it's delusioning, it's lonely, and most disturbing is, is that the truth cannot be told because it's so desperate. I'm here to tell you that there's people in this class this morning that are in a cave with a situation that's so desperate you can't even verbalize to anybody the difficulty you're facing. I've been there before. 
There was an article written, came out of Wheaton College. It was called Self-Disclosure in Biblical Perspective. Let me read you an excerpt from the article. It describes the pain of disclosing oneself to a local assembly. This article uh, is true. True words. I want you to listen to it. At church, excuse me, it's nothing short of tragic that many Christians are today finding more acceptance, support, and need fulfillment in secular encounter groups than they are in their churches. The lady goes on to say, At church I find no signs of illness around me, outfitted in their Sunday best shoes and smiles. We talk about where we're going, but seldom talk about what we're feeling. We may talk about spiritual victories, but we carefully camouflage defeats or struggles. On Sundays when I arrive at church in, a, in an acute need of spiritual healing, I feel alone and out of place in this atmosphere. I feel like a measled, spotted child in a nursery full of healthy youngsters. Once or twice I tried to talk about my distress during the Sunday school class, but I sensed tension build around as I described my symptoms. When the fever of struggle or defeat hits me now, I simply remain silent isolated from those around me who seem to know only perpetual good spiritual health. Fortunately, during my downtimes, I found a company of fellow strugglers in the Bible like David, Job, Peter, Thomas, Paul. They spoke honestly and movingly about their struggles. It's frustrating to know these men that, that I know these men in the Bible better than the people in my Sunday school class or church. Isn't that tragic? We don't share. We, we don't let people know when we're in the cave. Uh, and you've been there. You may be there now or you may be in one next week. Isn't it tragic that, uh, you know, all days are not up days. Could I get an amen right there? All days are not up days. Some days are low. Some days we've even lost our self-respect. You can't... See, we tend to glamorize everything, but the, the Bible, the way it speaks here, we're not supposed to glamorize this cave setting. We're not supposed to just quickly read over it and gloss over it and go to the next chapter. We're not supposed to gloss over this cave. This was a low point in his life. David at this point had every crutch pulled from under him. He was desperate. Think back about all he lost. You know, he lost his job. He was an officer and the top warrior with Saul in the army of Israel. Now, he had already killed Goliath. He had already got this tax-free household for his family. He had already been given one of David's daughters. I mean, he was the top warrior. But Saul got jealous. He lost his job. He lost his wife. Remember, she left him as a deceiver. Now, she lived with him later, but she was never with him in heart. I mean, she's the one that said, you dance like a fool. Here you are acting like that when the ark of God. I mean, she wasn't his wife. He lost his home and place where he lived. He lost his counselor, Samuel, as, as David was driven by Saul from the presence of Samuel. He lost his closest friend, Jonathan, Saul's son who banished him from being near David. He lost his self-respect. He lost his self-respect. You've got your Bible open there. Turn back to the very next chapter, 1 Samuel 21. Look at verse 10. I'm going to read it. Verse Samuel 21, verse 10. And David arose and fled that day in the fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is this not David, the king of the land? And do they not sing one to another him in dances and saying that Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And look at verse 12. And David laid upon those words in his heart and he was sore afraid of Ashix, the king of Gath. And look at verse 13 and 14 and 15. And he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and his spittle fell upon his beard. Then said Ashix to his servants, Lo, see the man is mad. Wherefore then have you brought him to me? Have I need of a madman that you have brought his fellow to play a madman in my presence? 
Shall this fellow come to my house? Hey, that was just before. Listen, David left, le lost his self-respect. He was grueling in his beard, scratching on the floor at the king of Gath like a madman. And then he left there and slithered into this cave. He, he lost it all. Th this was the lowest point of his life. You don't read that about David. You don't think about that. He was, he, he was crazy. I mean, slobbering and, I mean, I don't want to get too graphic, but you, you read the account. I mean, he, he, was, he was gone. So he lost his job, his wife, his home, his counselor, his closest friend, his self-respect, and then his pride. He acted like he was insane and slipped out and slithered out of town there in Jenna and ended up at this cave. So that's where we're at. So don't gloss over this. Don't forget it. And you know what? I'm weary I'm weary of those who think the Christian life is just one cloud to the next cloud. That is, a, that is heresy of Scripture. It's not. There are caves in our lives. And, and I don't want to bust your bubble, but I'm, you know that's the truth. You may have faced depression. You may have faced difficulty or a loss of a loved one or loss of financial health or loss of spiritual health or loss of, 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 of your physical health. There are caves. There are difficulties. And I'm tired of, of people preaching. Listen, I went to Oral Roberts University. I, I, I know. I, listen, I, I can tell you all about health and wealth and prosperity gospel. I've taken the classes. I've been to chapel. I've seen it all. Let me tell you, the cave, they don't preach the cave. But I'm tired of this narrative that the Christian life is one cloud to the next because it's not. There are caves in our life. There are caves in your life. Alan Redpath, now, now, he's a great British scholar and preacher, came to the United States and he was a pastor of Moody Church in the 50s for about 10 to 12 years. But he had a great statement. Alan Redpath said, The conversion of a soul is the miracle of a moment. The manufacture of a saint is the task of a lifetime. Let me repeat that. The conversion of the soul is the miracle of a moment. But the manufacture of a saint is the task of a lifetime. I promise you. I promise you, when David killed the bear and the lion, when he learned those sweet songs and was a tremendous harpist, such a musician that he was brought up to the king and said, listen, you are the best singer and player in the land. We got a job for you. Kill the, kill the, the giant, got free tax, got a new wife, got a promotion, was general of the army. He had no idea he'd be in a cave. It was simply unexpected. Turn to Psalm 142. Just, just, just flip over there. It's in the Old Testament. It's right after Psalm 141. But this is what he wrote when he was in the cave. Psalm 142. I'll give you a second for Dan to find it. Psalm 142, he said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice in the Lord did I make supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed him before my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, thou knowest my path and the way wherein I walked. For they have privily laid snare to me. I looked to my right hand, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for me. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from the persecutors, that I, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I might praise thy name. The righteous shall compass about me, for thou shalt deal bountifully. With me. Are you like those disciples? Remember those 12 that followed Jesus? They built their hope and dreams on the sunny shore of Galilee, but then despair came in Gethsemane and distraught and Golgotha. The poet Florence White Willett wrote this great poem called The Secret Place. 
And it says this, I thank God for bitter things. They've been a friend of grace. They've driven me from the paths of ease to the storm, the secret place. I thank Him for the friends who failed to fill my heart's deep need, for they've driven me to the Savior's feet upon His love to feed. I'm grateful too, though through lives no way should I could satisfy, so I found in God alone my rich, my full supply. I'm going to pause a minute. I want you to feel the dampness of this cave. Man, one minute, one minute the king's right-hand man, anything you wanted to eat, any, the comforts of, of that day, the, just, just anything you needed or wanted. And now you're, you, you've lost your self-respect. You, you've played a madman. You, you, you know, and, and now you're in a, a damp, dark, deep cave. Feel the dampness of that. David has nothing. So we must believe that God brought him to this place. So here's our lesson, to reroute our lives. That's what the name of the lesson is, rerouting our lives. Like I said in the GPS, it's so frustrating, rerouting, rerouting. I don't want to reroute. I think I know where I'm going. Well, God sometimes reroutes our lives, doesn't He? Human perspective says, hey, you've lost this. You've lost that. You've caused this problem. You've caused that problem. You've ruined this. You've ruined that. It's over. Your, your life is ended. But God says, no, David, your life's not over. I'm going to reroute your life. Your first direction was wrong, so I'm going to reroute your life. Notice that David, and, and as you notice in this portion of Scripture, David doesn't hang out a shingle. He didn't say, hey, the great warrior, the music dude. The guy that would, listen, if it was Spotify back then, he'd be all over it. I'm telling you, his music would be the top of the charts. He didn't hang out a shingle, say, hey, I'm going over to the cave. Y'all come see me. He wanted to be alone. He was going alone, and he wanted to be alone. But look who came, verses 1 and 2. His family showed up. Now they came to him. Now think back in David's early life. There was a time when David wasn't even significant with his family. Remember when, remember when they were looking for a king? Well, the, are these your sons? Well, I got one little guy. He's, he's, he's back there with the sheep. He's not much. I mean, he wasn't even significant with his family. They came. They came. He wasn't in the lineup when they were looking for the king. And you know what? Later on, a few years later, when the battle was going on, and David shows up, remember, with cheese and everything, you know, some provision, the brothers said, I know the naughtiness of your heart. I know the reason you're here. You just want to show up and see the battle. He didn't have any respect from his brothers. But they showed up. They really loved him. And you know what? People really love you. People really love you. Don't forget that. If you hear nothing else this morning, God loves you and I love you and people love you. Don't forget that. David forgot that. Forgot, he forgot that. Let me inject this. When you're in the cave, you don't want people around. I, I know. I've been there. I, I, you don't want people around. Listen, if you've been involved in leadership, there's, there's times when you really don't want to see anybody. You know, I'm sure Pastor Powell would say, you know, pastoring wouldn't be too bad if it wasn't for people. You know? But when you're in a cave, you don't want anybody around. But that's not good for you. People showed up. They showed up. In fact, you can't stand to be around people. You just want to be alone. You know, it's kind of this worm theology. You know what that worm theology is? I, I, I'm just no good. I'm fuzzy. I'm ugly. I'm scratchy. No one wants to be around me. And if they're around me, they'll start itching too. You know, I just, you just, uh, just stay back. I'm toxic. You know, just be a just, it's best if you don't hang around me right now. Because I'm. that's not God's plan. And that's not what's good for you. It's what we want. Be honest. Don't you just want to be alone sometime? Sure you do. But look at the... Uh, but not only did his family show up. And, and I love this analogy I heard one time. His family crawled and slithered into the cave with him. 
Now, it was not great accommodations. It wasn't an Airbnb. You know, it, the towels weren't laid out. You know, when I check into Hampton and there's those fresh cookies, mm, they got my name on them. You know, and it wasn't like that. They slithered into the cave with him. They're like, oh, David, this is rough. But look who showed up. Not only his family, but strangers came. They were pressured people, stressed people, distressed people, indebted people, bitter people. They had issues. So there's other people that showed up. 400 worms in the cave. And a few chapters later, that number increases to 600. Now, he was in a rough place. Remember, he was low. But you know what? God raised him up and he became a captain. The, the, the Bible uses that terminology that he became a captain. He became a leader. God knew he was a leader. God, God gave him a ministry in the middle of his mess. And, and listen, you need to learn that too. Sometimes, all the time, when we go through something, it's so we can help somebody else and we can help them through their difficulties. But David accepted that chore, the task, and he was right there. He was a uniquely gifted musician working with a bunch of guys with no skill, no taste, no manners. Can't you imagine David trying to teach those 400 guys how to sing? Horrible. And I don't want to go too far, but you know that, you think that cave had to stink with 400 to 600 men in there? <laughs> it was not a good place. I mean, it, it wasn't a good place to live, a good place to be. It was a rough place, difficult place. But David was working. It was a place of training. You know, and, and, and I know I'm talking a lot about these specific guys, but it's important. Did you know that these 400 guys were the same guys that later David trained to be warriors, his champions? These guys were his cabinet when he became king. So he took a bunch of nobodies, distressed, depressed, pressured, indebted, people with marks on their back. I mean, like, hey, if you show up, we're going to get you. He took those guys, trained them, made them warriors, and they were cabinet members when he became king. He turned them around. He turned them around. God can reroute your life and use you for his glory. Look at some of the scripture that gives this context. As we read in Psalm 142, he is on his face. He's at his lowest moment. Psalm 57, let me read you a few verses. This tells us that he was on his knees. Again, Psalm 142, he's on his face. Psalm 57, he's on his knees. Let me read it for you. It says, Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusted in thee. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God the Most High. Unto God that performeth all things to me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of them that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions and I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. For they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me in the midst of fallen of themselves. And he goes on. He, he says, my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O God, among the people. I will sing unto thee of the nations. For the mercy is great into the heavens and thy truth into the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let the glory be above the earth. So we saw the difference in his posture there. He was on his face in 142, on his knees in, in, in Psalm 57. But lastly, in, on Psalm 34, he's on his feet. Psalm 34, he's on his feet. It's a very short psalm. I won't read it all, but I'm going to read you a couple excerpts. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. He's up now. And one of my favorite verses and my wife's favorite verse in the whole Bible is Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. Isn't that a great salvation verse? The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him and delivereth him. Listen, David was in a bind, but oh, now he's up. He's thinking, he's, oh, God's on my side. He's going to take care of me. And he does. 
He does. Verse 20 of that same psalm says, He keepeth all his bones, not one of them broken. So you can see during the narrative of David's life the psalms that he writes during that period of his life, how desperate they were, how desperate that he were. Turn, turn, turn one place. I want, you to, I want you to look at one verse. And I want you to think about, uh, turn to Psalm 34. Psalm 34 verse 19. Now, this is the DVR, the David Revised Version. So don't, it's, it's, it's not King James. But read this. Many are the afflictions of the righteous... But the Lord delivered them out of all of them. Take the liberty this morning to change the word afflictions to caves. Many are the caves of the righteous. But the Lord delivered him out of all of them. Quickly we have three applications and then we'll go. What did change in the cave? What changes in the cave took place in our situations in our lives when we go through caves? And I know I don't need a raise of hand because there's no one in this room that's never not been in a cave. You have been in a cave. You may be in a cave. Listen, there's some people that are in such desperate straits that you can't even verbalize what you're dealing with. But there's three applications we want to talk about. The first one is this. David was hurt enough to admit his need. He was hurt enough to admit his need. When you're hurting, it needs to be declared. Are you faking it? We do that really well. Man, you guys all look great today. All in your Sunday best. All dolled up, as my dad would say. You know, everybody's got their hair fixed, curled, maybe colored. Uh, I let my highlights just take over. But, uh, you know, uh, we're good at faking it. Oh, it's great. How's it going, David? One, great, 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 great. Everything's wonderful. But deep down there's something. Are you all together? Are, are you that all together? Is your life really that all together? Yes, God's been good and we look at His blessings and we should ruminate over those blessings and we recall those blessings and we thank the Lord for those blessings. But God does not want you this morning to gloss over the cave. Be honest with yourself and with others. Be, be honest with yourself. Say, Look, man, I, I'm not doing good. I, 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 I got something going on. Maybe you can share it with your friends, your wife, your spouse, somebody in your D group, somebody, you know, a brother, a sister, somebody. But David was hurt enough to admit he had a need. And I think when his brother showed up, even though he didn't want him, I guarantee you David wanted to be alone. But they showed up, they loved on him, and they were there. So David was hurt enough to admit his need. Number two, David was honest enough to cry for help. We see that in that psalm we read, Psalm 57. We, we live under such a veneer that we really don't know who we are sometimes. We have, we have sugar-coated everything and... and and thought about it in our minds and processed it and reasoned it out. Ah, it's not that bad. Or, ah, this, it's, just, it's just something I'm going through. You know, we don't even admit to ourselves. We're not even honest enough with ourselves to cry for help. David lost everything and got to the place where he said, Man, I, I mean, I can't fool nobody. Everybody knows I lost my job, my wife, my friends, my best friend, my counselor. I mean, everybody wants to kill me. I'm nuts. I'm graveling in my beard. I, I, you know, I'm a, you know, everybody wants to be dead. 
I mean, he was at the end of his road, but he was honest enough to cry for help. Sometimes we need to strip away the veneer, you know, strip away the, you know, that, that, and, and look at that. And, and listen, I, I get, I get so weary of HGTV. You know, everybody thinks that you can go into a home and HGTV and everybody's happy and healthy and wise and everything looks good in 30 minutes. That doesn't happen in real life, amen? It takes months to get a permit. It takes months to get materials. I mean, it, it takes, you know, divorces, everything else happened in between construction projects I've been involved with. It's rough. But anyway, but in HGTV, everything wraps up within 25 minutes and there's a commercial and they're all hugging. Oh, I love my house. But you ever notice when they strip the veneer off the floor, those old floors just jump to life or maybe that, that kitchen table that was a heirloom and they strip the veneer off and they get all that old junk off and wow. That's what we need to do. We, we need to just strip the veneer off. That, all those coats and coats and coats of junk and varnish. and uh, Just strip it off and let God see who He knows anyway. He knows anyway. And number three. So number one, he was hurt enough to admit he needed help. Number two, he was honest enough to cry for help. And number three, he was humble enough to learn from God. We read that in Psalm 34. Uh, we can move from cave to cave in our Christian life and never get humble enough to learn from Him. But I want to challenge you to learn from the situations that we're in. I don't want to go through some stuff again. Do you? I, I don't want to repeat that class. I do not want to repeat some of the lessons I've learned. I want to get it. The fact is I want to get it so bad I want to share with people what I got so they don't have to take that class. He was humble enough to learn from God and get out of the cave. Now let me, let me, let me close with this little quick thought. And, and I know you, you may think I'm stretching it, but I'm not. Aren't you glad, and we're going to close, aren't you glad that Jesus left heaven to come to this cave, this, this world, this difficult, slimy, dirty, sin-cursed situation the God of heaven left heaven to come to our cave to get us out and to restore us where we can be saved. That, that, that's one of the greatest lessons that I see in this. Not only is it just a personal lesson that we can get out of this mess that we're in, this, this depression, this, 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 this difficulty you're in, physical, spiritual, whatever, but man, salvation... Listen, he came and he, you were in the cave. You were in the slew of despond. You were, you were in the slimy cave of sin and God came and rescued you. He took residence with us. These, we're all misfits. You know, David here was with four to six hundred misfits. I mean, basically criminals, okay? But David said, come on, I got you. We'll, we'll get through this together. So God says, hey, I got you. I, I, my son's paid the price. We're going to get through this. Salvation's real. It's free. You just got to accept it. We're going to change. You're going to change from the inside out. I love you. I died for you. You're going to make it. And I believe in you. And that's exactly what David did to these 400 guys. He said, listen, man, I, you know, look, I'm in a cave too. But I love you and I'm going to invest in you and we're going to, get, we're going to turn this thing around. And that's exactly what the God of heaven did when He sent Jesus for us. In our, he, 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 he provided for us. He, he chose to be with us, us misfits. He chose to love us, provide for us, use us, instruct us. And you know what? One of the greatest things He did, and we're going to close, is that He has shined His light in my cave and my difficulties in life. <sighs> You know, we face different areas of life. Remember when your last parent passed away? And that responsibility of the patriarch, matriarch fell on your shoulders? You're like, I got a lot of eyes looking at me. 
you know. Mom and dad's gone. The old home place is gone. I mean, now they come to my house. Remember, remember that realization when you thought, oh, just the weight, just the weight of these little eyes looking at me. And, and I'm like, you come to the wrong place. I don't have a lot of wisdom. I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've seen a few things, done a few things like that TV commercial said, but, you know, mm -mm. There, there's, so there's difficulties. You know, there's, there's things in our lives at our ages that we don't know the answer for. So we're in a cave from time to time. You, you, listen, don't ever get so big that you don't think you'll ever be in a cave. Because all it takes is one phone call, one difficulty, one bad diagnosis, one car wreck, one phone call from your children, one difficulty. We're right there. So let me challenge you. Caves are bad. They are bad. They're not where you want to be. But you will find yourself in one. But we just told you how to get out. You, you can get out. God want, God's going to get you out if you hang on to Him. He will shine His light into your cave. I'm so glad that He did. I'm so glad that He did. Father, we love you. We thank you for this, this difficult, painful story about David. As a child in primary class, I don't ever remember one flannel graph of the cave of Adullam. But I remember David and Goliath. I remember the flannel graph of killing the bear, the harp. I remember that one. But I never remember the flannel graph of the, in primary class of the cave. Help us not to gloss over this because this is real Christian living. This is where we're at. I'm speaking to some people today here and online that are in a cave in the slew of despond, such a deep place that they just don't know where to go next. May you send somebody their way. I know you're there. Let them sense your presence. But let us be the hands and feet of Jesus and let us come into other folks' cave and help them to minister to them like David's family ministered to him. And then, Lord, give us a ministry out of our cave. Give us the help that we can be to somebody else. We can help them through their difficult times. Because this is for a purpose. This, this learning process is for a purpose. It's not selfish. We're to share. We're to give. We love you and thank you. Thank you for the rest of this day. We pray you be with Pastor. Bless the music as it comes up. We just love you and thank you in Christ's name. We